Uh, some uh, uh, with a quite uh, significant part also on visual language navigation and uh, parenthesis on uh, equivariance. And this is a uh, uh, joint, uh, uh, the language part of the joint work with uh, Dan Roth's uh, uh, group at Penn. All right, as Florian said, uh, five years ago uh, we wrote this paper, the probabilistic data association for uh, uh, semantic slam. Uh, where uh, what uh, we, we really sought was both uh, localization uh, and uh, mapping uh, using uh, semantic key points for objects, a technology we developed for humans. And uh, this is a demo from a later uh, uh, paper uh, joined with a group of Dan Kotchek, where uh, the robot does a reactive planning based uh, on uh, the uh, like a semantic map of uh, objects uh, in the scene plus uh, an occupancy map. And uh, this is one of the places in planning where we don't use the semantics for language or communication. The main reason we use the semantics because it is much uh, easier to navigate and build an occupancy map if you just have abstract geometric descriptions of the objects instead of the point cloud of the objects. Okay, so by recognizing the object, we place them in the map, and they immediately have, have a much lower dimensional representation in order to do reactive uh, planning. And uh, in, uh, but this was still uh, like uh, pretty much classical uh, slum. So what is uh, what uh, uh, is classical slum? Slum uh, first, uh, it really most of the focus on the slum, and this is uh, also because uh, many of us came from the computer vision community, was more on the L than the M, okay? It was more on the localization, uh, where uh, we were, there's a visual autometry, and uh, uh, 
there was more on finding your path. And after you have found your path, or at the same time as the essence, the simultaneous, then you would actually try to build a, a map. And uh, the basic setup is that you would run the map exhaustively, and uh, then you would do uh, planning in order to go from A to B, which is really the basic thing you want to solve in robotics in any task, from a configuration A to a configuration B, whether it's navigation or manipulation. You have to plan your path in some configuration space. And uh, uh, in most of the downstream tasks, uh, we really needed to have a map first, like to do the, the plan. While, and even if uh, the map was unknown, we would run uh, a classic exploration, which pretty much was uh, exhaustive exploration. So like uh, a frontier exploration, it really doesn't uh, use any actually prior knowledge about the environment. And uh, uh, you really had to do it in order to go from A to B. Moreover, in the slum, uh, uh, un until we introduced semantics, we could not really use it in interacting with humans. With humans, the only interaction would be that you click on the place on the map and tell the robot to go there. So here, we are interested uh, in tasks where the agent will go from A to B without uh, ever being on in this place and a really unseen environment and also where there is no time to really build a map of the environment. <coughs> what I mean by that, there's no time to first go around and then plan from A to B. And uh, there are three uh, problems that I'm going to present here. Uh, one is really the metric from A to B. I will do it very shortly. And uh, please interrupt me at any point, okay? Because some of this is pretty like recent stuff. Uh, all of all of the three results, all of the results that uh, I'm going to present are papers in 2022. And uh, it's, uh, so I'm going to present a, a result going from A to B using only an occupancy concept. A result from A going from A to B where the B is like uh, go to the sink uh, using both occupancy and uh, semantics. And the third is follow a real language instruction. And uh, in the point, uh, this is called the point nav. Uh, this is the uh, so-called point nav and object nav task have been defined by the meta people who produced also this environment called the habitat. And in this environment, you're really given a goal here, a goal B, and you're trying to reach it in a specific number of steps and if possible with the shortest path. So there is no time in order to go around here, map a place, and then find uh, the target uh, B, the way we have done it in the past when we were running exploration. So in order to solve this, uh, you really need uh, uh, to uh, predict a path that is obviously traversable. And uh, in order to do it efficiently, there is no other way than uh, try to hallucinate what is the occupancy of the map beyond what you're seeing. So what you really want is uh, to really predict whether the path you're starting from here will be really actually not go to any actually dead end. So you are uh, visiting many, many environments, and after you have run a learning, actually, algorithm training, you are able, from the very first, actually, point where you are, of course, you run the registration always from SNAM, uh, you to visit uh, some places where you're going to be able to predict better what is coming. And you have an exploration objective, where you need to visit places where you're going to get a much better actually way from uh, to predict and also obviously to go closer to the goal. And this really seems in the occupancy uh, uh, problem it uh, 
Uh, people also have solved it with uh, traditional reinforcement learning. So I'm not going to stay into that. I only wanted to say that if you want to do it efficiently, you need uh, somehow to predict what is coming. And uh, the second and most important is the object map, where uh, uh, the task is, for example, find stool or go to the sink. And uh, here, uh, we're given the odometry. So it is the opposite of what I was doing for 20 years, where I was really focusing on the odometry. We are given the localization. We don't solve any localization problem. And uh, this is uh, one of the uh, like uh, environments here. You start from a point, and uh, you want to reach uh, the sofa. And this is the input what you have. Any questions on the setup? So it is really very natural setup. And you have to do it uh, in uh, an unseen environment. And these environments where we're working are really environments with very high visual complexity and quite a varying uh, layout. So uh, there are several environments like Replica, Robothor, Egyptian, and we are working really with a habitat which has uh, 1,000 uh, scenes. And uh, the floor space uh, in terms of square meters is uh, 365. Uh, thousand uh, square meters. So the there was quite a much in both navigation complexity and uh, visual complexity. So in order to solve this task, we really have to predict what is coming beyond our line of sight. So, and the way we split our system is that uh, the, in the classical reinforcement learning setup, what we would uh, you would do just to predict the next uh, action is you would be given an observation, you would be predict an action like turn, move forward, or stop, and then uh, uh, you would have some value function whether you are close to the goal. So we solve this problem by first predicting a target location where it can be with respect to me and uh, splitting this in a prediction and then uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, like estimating an action. So the very first problem on from uh, observations from our point of view to predict where the target uh, will be is really uh, is be, uh, a problem where we really have to hallucinate things. So I'm in this room and uh, I have the goal to go to the uh, restrooms, which uh, for example, statistically many times they are close to the elevators, so that I have some prior built about having visited a lot of uh, like uh, university environments. And I really need from this point here to predict actually what is behind these walls in order to really have uh, a target goal location with respect to me. And after I predict this target goal location, I really solve the metric task I presented first, the point goal, which is just going from A to B, given like an occupancy map. So this is uh, so the, this is really the semantic prediction, and this is really the metric uh, execution after we predict the target. And uh, there has been few works. Most representative is this work from Insight. Uh, Facebook at that time, now Meta, where uh, they use just object detectors. And uh, they, this is the closest to what it works, uh, which also works with maps. And uh, it uh, just uh, predicts uh, a goal and uh, tries to reach uh, this goal. So our main uh, difference and novelty in this work is that given uh, all possible environments that exist, there was no way to traverse all these environments really exhaustively in order to build a very good model, prior model of environment, like a floor of a university space. And uh, to do that, we really uh, applied something that is uh, uh, an active process during learning. Uh, so the 
uh, the main actually setup that we have is that we are given RGBD uh, uh, measurements. Uh, from the depth, we can back project and uh, create an occupancy uh, uh, map uh, M. And uh, then uh, from the RGP, we're creating a semantic map, which we also back project. Uh, there is, uh, we, we do 3D, but this is ongoing work. Here is everything, just back projection in a 2D floor, like a blueprint. We don't uh, deal with, uh, uh, even if uh, like the, this our counter or the laptop is on the pedestal, these are just uh, orthogonally projected vertically to the floor. And then uh, we predict where is the sofa. We take into account the uncertainty in this prediction. And then uh, we select the goal. And then we are just apply an off-the-shelf policy to reach the goal. And uh, how we establish these intermediate uh, representations, we have uh, a unit for semantic segmentation. This is really very classic stuff. We have a ground projection. We have a fusion with the occupancy. We have a fusion a long time. And the main thing about this is look at the original image, what the original image is, which is inside the, uh, this room. But we still predict everything around a specific area. So we predict really beyond what uh, we see in front of us. Uh, we predict things that are behind, so it is like the, the, the table with the chairs. And uh, we try, in this sense, to predict objects that are outside the field of view. And this is what we call like hallucinated regions. So there is no way to uh, establish this goal efficiently without hallucination. This is the message. Now, in order to do active training, and to sample the space in an efficient way. Uh, we use a measure of model uncertainty. Uh, model uncertainty has been studied extensively in Bayesian learning, uh, like Yaring Gall's thesis and Zubin uh, Gafamani's work has been pioneering in Cambridge. And uh, there are several ways to compute the uncertainty of a semantic prediction. Uh, here we use uh, the variance in the actual soft maxis. If f is the soft max of prediction, we use the variance of the soft maxis across the ensemble, and then we add it over classes. And this is one of the measures that very roughly approximates the information gain of every measurement. The way it works is that uh, you can run it. You have uh, several networks that are running in parallel. This is obviously increasing the running time uh, both uh, during training and during inference in a linear way. And uh, then uh, we take the soft maxis of all of these predictions that you see there for a number of classes, like in this case it is, I think, seven. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, you compute the variance. Um, so we test uh, the first study we did is uh, if you want uh, really to select uncertain places, what is the more best uh, information gain measure? And this is everything from uh, a really beautiful paper. I really recommend you to read the Deep Bayesian Active Learning with Image Data from uh, Yaring Gal. And uh, we tried. Uh, so this is that when we are building the map and uh, we are measuring the intersection of a union and you are seeing that this is a really difficult task in the intersection of a union here is like 25% uh, in the best case uh, we have a variation between doing this offline which by the way would also take really uh, an order of magnitude more measurements and uh, between using the mutual information here which is uh, derived in uh, Yarin's uh, paper, which is uh, actually an approximate version of the information uh, gain, which is uh, the entropy uh, of the means minus the mean entropy, and the ensemble variance, which is uh, really just the variance of the outputs across the ensemble. And uh, we have studied 
uh, like the effect of uh, both uh, occupancy prediction and uh, semantic prediction of the offline versus active. Uh, when the, the active in the active case, we have been in this uh, comparison here. We have uh, we calibrate for the number of the measurements in the offline, and for the same number of approximately the same number of measurements, we perform better with active, and uh, also in. Uh, 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 using uh, the estimate from the image segmentation versus a ground truth estimate with uh, what is called in the habitat environment semantic sensor which gives you uh, ground truth semantic uh, measurements. And uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, the, we are doing pretty well with respect to the ground truth here. So this is the ground truth and you have semantic ground truth in the images. This is just to study how well your image segmentor is. And uh, we are doing better uh, in uh, when we apply the active approach, uh, when we normalize with respect to the number of measurements. So in the offline here, it is really a just a sampling of the environment. And uh, uh, another, actually, effect of uh, uh, selecting data according to and information gain is that uh, we have a much uh, uh, more actually balanced uh, equality uh, of performance uh, across uh, classes, which uh, uh, I, I don't really have a, so much intuitive uh, explanation, but uh, uh, it uh, probably also has to do that uh, uh, image segmentation algorithms have not been uh, like in general, what we see otherwise is that uh, uh, your data sets are not that uh, balanced. So this is, uh, these are results from uh, uh, like this, our semantic prediction, like the hallucination, uh, out of a uh, few measurements. And uh, this is uh, our, uh, uh, this is really the ground truth of uh, the semantic segmentation. And why it's looking pretty well, you will going to see that uh, in uh, the measurements, uh, it's uh, when we try to exploit it in order to uh, reach the goal, uh, it, it is a task where we are still actually very far from solving. And not only us, even like actually the state of the art. So uh, after uh, this, what I described was really how we collect uh, like samples during training. Uh, during actual inference, uh, we need to select a goal. And again, we use the confidence uh, in the goal. So we have two situations, one with where we can choose uh, the location of the goal, uh, where we, we call it safe exploitation, uh, where uh, uh, we use a lower bound from the mean of the ensemble and the variance, and the other is which uh, we call optimistic exploration, where uh, we have a, uh, we follow places where there is a higher uncertainty. We really hope that although the uncertainty is high, that we are gain uh, by seeing more of the environment and uh, also reaching the goal. That's why we call it optimistic. And uh, this is uh, the success rate. Uh, the success rate is really at 34 percent. So for an environment, for a task uh, that uh, I, I would have expected when we started working that we can really get it close to 50-50, right? So only 34 percent of the cases where you're given a go-to sofa, go-to table, go-to somewhere, uh, uh, you can uh, achieve your goal in a specific number of steps. And uh, we compare with uh, uh, this is with uh, having our learning approach, but a frontier-based exploration, which is 20%. And uh, this is by using two different, uh, using the same actually goal selection, but offline versus active during training. And uh, this is uh, uh, by using a classical semantic uh, uh, segmentation. Uh, 
So there is still a lot of work to do. So this was, uh, we published it and uh, we had some novel stuff, but uh, uh, there is uh, still uh, quite an open, this is still quite an open problem. Yes. So is, uh, is partial success with navigation important to measure here, or are you just measuring whether you achieve the task? So, yeah, that's, uh, 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 success is uh, really that you were there, and also that you know that you're there. That's uh, what we define as success. In the SPL, the other measure is the shortest uh, path length. Uh, so, which has a threshold, and then we we uh, we measure the percent that they exceeded the, that they not exceeded they went under a threshold for the shortest path length. Now, uh, a very big uh, problem is that uh, uh, what we call the oracle. Stop. Uh, which is uh, so this is uh, something that uh, we really like to study these systems and uh, uh, let's say uh, the first what we see here the first is our full approach and then the second is our approach with our predicted map and then uh, a, uh, a ground truth execution to the goal that somebody after we are predicted the goal somebody like draws a path and uh, they, uh, which means that uh, we still have uh, even if we have found the correct location of the goal in our prediction that I know for example the rest of uh, like uh, 25 meters uh, like 2 o'clock I still have difficulty a difficulty of 18% of reaching it the second is the uh, oracle but uh, uh, I have to decide that I have reached the goal and I still have difficulty like saying that I am there. If an oracle tells me that I am there, again I increase the performance for 18%. And if both I have a ground truth path uh, and also I apply an oracle stop, then I can increase it to 80%. Which really means that uh, there is a lot also where to do beyond having actually a good uh, like map. So uh, I think I'm going to skip this. You can read it in the paper. Uh, reaching the goal is uh, we apply the uh, DD PPO, uh, which is the learning near perfect point goal navigation. And uh, I think I'm going to go. So this is a, a video of uh, like what uh, we see. So this is what uh, the robot uh, sees. And this is uh, for the point goal problem without semantics. And uh, I must have some video from the Semantics. Uh, yeah. Here. So this is uh, from uh, going to table. Uh, this is the map that is built, uh, the uh, occupancy and the semantic map. And uh, this was uh, on the bottom is uh, really the accuracy, and this is uh, the the path towards the table. Uh, here, oh, here it is bad, the new target. So let's see. So here is reaching the bed. And then it's reaching the sofa. And you see how far you were from the, also from uh, uh, your target when you started, right? You're starting just in this case where the sofa was obviously not uh, visible. So, um, I have two slides in the middle which are irrelevant. Yes. Uh, so, I guess, can you talk a bit about how frequently you update the policy versus how frequently you update the, the segmentation? Uh, 
the segmentation is updated uh, every frame, uh, which means uh, after every uh, motion you do, and uh, the motions uh, here are, uh, are discrete. There is a discrete uh, uh, like spectrum of uh, motions. Uh, the localization is uh, here is perfect. It's given by an or by a, pretty much by an oracle, sure. like a GP in the GPS. But what about the policy that's navigating? Uh, the policy after I have selected the goal, uh, this is uh, like an uh, off-the-shelf uh, go-to point okay. policy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we didn't invent anything there. Now, we go to something even harder, uh, which is uh, uh, interacting with uh, a robot, interacting with language instruction. And there are several other like uh, tasks there, including manipulation. Uh, put the Roomba stuff because we really expect that Amazon, by buying the iRobot, probably they will solve this problem if they rec record all the uh, commands on Alexa. So, what is the vision language navigation task? The vision language navigation is that you're given a human instruction like this one. You are in a bedroom, turn around to the left until you see a door leading out into a hallway, go through it, uh, hang your right, and then walk between the island and the couch on your left. When you are between the second and third chairs for the island, stop. And uh, there is a, a humans have executed uh, those uh, instructions. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you uh, need to know that you have reached your goal in order to be uh, successful. Uh, so, and we want to solve this task in an, in an unseen uh, environment. So with uh, equally visual complexity as the previous one, uh, very partial observability, and uh, a lot of uh, diversity in the natural language and what we really need ideally is really to ground this instruction uh, to the visual input in terms of space, semantics and uh, the actions. So the current methods are uh, either like recurrent units like this uh, GRU, uh, the beyond the nav graph which uh, is uh, uh, I introduced the problem also in a continuous space uh, because before uh, there were versions where they had already pre-selected places where the robot would be pretty much jump and this problem was in much uh, not a really realistic robotic uh, setting and uh, there is the uh, uh, other approaches which uh, really solved it uh, it's just a prediction directly of an action uh, after you see the visual input and uh, uh, the, the language. So um, we thought that uh, having such an experience in mapping, we thought that the best what we can do is uh, really just uh, solve the mapping problem instead of just seeing the video selecting an action that would align the video with the language. Uh, we prefer to align the language with a map, and uh, obviously an egocentric map, because the instructions are egocentric, and uh, then uh, try to reach uh, the next goal pretty much in a similar fashion that we have done before. On the other hand, we want also to see whether the language can help in the previous task on establishing better semantic uh, maps. And there is some evidence from recent literature uh, that uh, uh, landmark-based navigation instructions really improve your capability on uh, like having a spatial awareness in uh, real environments. So the first thing we did, and this was really an idea of uh, uh, Dan Roth from the NLP, was uh, forget really the actual visual images and imagine that you're holding a map. And this is uh, actually this image is from Dali. These days, instead of drawing something in PowerPoint, you just put the text in 
Bell, if I put uh, like a person holding a map uh, in front of a, like in a mall, I have written, and Dali has produced this beautiful image. So imagine that you are holding a map. You're not just seeing like this room, but I hold the whole blueprint from the fourth floor. Fourth? What floor is that? Fifth. Fifth <laughs> floor. Fifth floor in my home building. So how can this help me on solving the language instruction problem? And uh, assuming that uh, you are good in orienting the map with your egocentric point of view, so forget. let's uh, not uh, deal with uh, uh, like orientation problems. So, so you're having a semantic map, and uh, the main idea that we wanted to test is uh, if uh, we have uh, uh, a map parser that would extract uh, really the semantic layout, and we have an instruction parser, whether we could align those two with uh, an attention mechanism, and uh, based on those two, predict, uh, establish uh, first uh, a better map, okay? And uh, let's uh, start uh, with, uh, and also a path uh, that uh, is similar to the uh, that, that reflects the instruction. So let's start with a ground truth map, not even a video. And uh, uh, we, apply, we can apply a cross modal attention uh, with the language. Create, so the map will be the query in the attention, and the language will be the key. And we're going to get a, 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 a result which uh, will be on the map space. And uh, then we apply, a, like again, a unit, like the same one that we applied in the semantic segmentation. And uh, we can train this uh, just uh, with a ground truth semantic map. So then instead of doing only the prediction of uh, the map, what we can do is also predict a path of 10 waypoints that would really reflect the, uh, the instruction. And the reason this is, and this is uh, us and uh, two or three other works, uh, that really differentiate ourselves to the rest of the literature where the prediction is not the action, but uh, the prediction is really a whole path that reflects uh, the environment, the instruction. And the reason why, why we chose the path is because we believe that the path is really the grounding of the instruction, of the whole instruction, in uh, this uh, uh, map. So let's uh, correct. So this is uh, uh, again we still stay with uh, the ground truth map. Then uh, and uh, we're gonna we, we see really if the attention between language uh, uh, and uh, vision uh, makes uh, any sense. So, for example, we take uh, because in the A matrix you have uh, the grid, the grid of the map in the Q. So it, it is vectorized, but we can really reshape it to look at it like a map. And uh, you have uh, as a key. The, the language, which is just uh, like the tokens. And if you choose, for example, the token couches, we looked uh, inside uh, one of the heads of the attention metrics. We might have, I might have even added them. Uh, whether it correlates with uh, a couch. And somewhere here, where there are couches on both sides of this table, we see a lot of activation. Uh, again, like for the table, which is a uh, Somewhere, uh, this is a table, and I think, I don't know if this is a table as well, like a desk. Then uh, we see also some activation. So the attention, uh, before actually we only had uh, to predict based on the ground of the map, the attention here really somehow grounds uh, the, the language uh, into our, uh, uh, like, uh, Semantic uh, map. Yeah. 
are you observing probabilistic grounding in the sense that if there's an ambiguity, uh, like the, there are two tables, for example, but the instructions talk about a single table without Yeah, it uh, just uh, shows usually, in, I think in, in the SOFA case it was in both signs. So, no, it, uh, it doesn't do instance. It is really like uh, semantic segmentation. And uh, then uh, we use, uh, uh, so this is another uh, attention representation where uh, we plot actually the result in the decoder. And uh, uh, here, uh, somehow, we uh, we overlay all possible, uh, this is like the U, and we overlay all possible actually correlations uh, uh, across, uh, we take the maximum uh, over uh, several uh, like uh, rows of the attention uh, metrics. Um, now, uh, Let me just go directly to the, I'm going to skip the math and uh, go directly. Yeah, this is another example of uh, uh, like uh, cross-modal activation, like uh, where exactly reflects what you said, there are like more than 10 doors in this environment. And uh, let's introduce now the video and what present, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm going to uh, show it now, and I'm going to show also the uh, loss function. Uh, so again, uh, for the... Uh, now, we're going to go to the full VLN task, where we are not holding a map, but uh, we are seeing uh, just the uh, incoming video. So, and, but uh, because we, I showed in the previous, in the object enough uh, uh, task, uh, how we can hallucinate the whole map, we really hallucinate the whole, pretty much we try to hallucinate uh, the whole floor from what we're seeing. And instead of using the printed map that you're holding, we're using the hallucinated map. So what is really happening is, uh, again, we use uh, a semantic segmentation of the image, we project it to the ground, and uh, the ground uh, is usually much bigger than the, uh, the just uh, the back projection. We use the depth because we really want good occupancy and traversability, and uh, so O is the occupancy, and uh, S is the semantic map. And uh, this is our previous map prediction, okay, where we are using uh, only uh, a loss uh, for a uh, ground truth segmentation. Now, to this, oops, uh, we are going to add the following. We are going to add the instruction. We run it through an encoder, through BERT. And then the result of this, we put it uh, as in a cross-modal map attention together with uh, first the occupancy. And the idea is really that we're walking, actually the motion actually tokens correspond to like uh, untraversable spaces in the map. And uh, we add it also, this is the occupancy, and we add it also to the segmentation, the O and the S. And we predict uh, a map which Again, we train with uh, ground truth map loss. Now, to achieve the goal of VLN, we have to predict a path. And for this path, uh, we run it through, again, a unit, where we predict the path the way we predict uh, key points in images. So for 10 paths, we have uh, 10 heat maps. And uh, this is our path prediction. And here we have a ground truth for the path, which is given in the data set. And so we have the two losses, both the map learning and the uh, uh, the 
path prediction. And uh, the first uh, ablation we did was really to uh, run uh, the full cross-modal uh, vision language navigation without the map attention uh, where we used both like cross-modal uh, for creating the map. And we already see that uh, this is uh, already plays a big role that when we don't use the map attention it goes up to 42 um, it goes down to 33 percent. How much time do I have? Five? Five minutes. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go to the uh, to the actual controller for the action. What we really do is we check, we take always the closest waypoint from the 10 waypoints. We run again the DPPO, and then we predict again all the waypoints. And uh, the reason we predict again all the waypoints, that we don't do it in one run, is because uh, we uh, always want to ground better to improve the grounding of the instruction on the whole map. So I predict 10 waypoints. Let's say I choose the sixth. I go to the sixth, and then I predict again all the 10 waypoints. Uh, all right, these are the results. And uh, this is... Uh, these are which matter, the uh, unseen environments. And uh, uh, we are here, and uh, this is another waypoint paper, the LAW, which uh, is the only one that is really surpassing our performance. The performance uh, that you see here is uh, again in the orders of between uh, 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 like in the success rate is at the 35 percent. It's really, and we have 34.3, uh, and uh, uh, this is still actually an open problem. The only actually, uh, in the way we are training, um, yeah, I'm not going to go into breaking down the results. Uh, let me show you a video of how this execution really looks like. Every time we predict different waypoints, this is the depth map and this is the actual image. And uh, red is our prediction and blue is uh, the ground truth. And uh, we show ground truth uh, uh, on the right and uh, predict both map and waypoints on the left. Uh, this is another one, walk straight past the table, turn right to the kitchen, to go between the kitchen counters and walk straight past the refrigerator. Uh, let me go to some uh, ablations we have done to study what really matters in uh, the VLM. So with the first experiment we so we have done three experiments. One is really to eliminate completely the language. Uh, who knows? Maybe our uh, network really doesn't pay attention to the language. The next is uh, to... That I'm not going to show, the software removal. Uh, we had several language removals. Uh, I'm going to show the blanking the semantic objects, uh, which means uh, no information in the map. And uh, the last one is very interesting, which is the uh, left-right mirroring. So this is uh, running the network, uh, like during testing, uh, running the VLN without the language. So we put uh, just uh, random vectors uh, in the input of the, uh, the cross-modal attention. And uh, uh, okay, it obviously deteriorates. You see the waypoints uh, and uh, so this is uh, the accuracy with uh, uh, the full the light blue and the black is uh, the prediction with no instruction actually it doesn't do that bad okay and this means really that there is a strong bias inductive bias in the network uh, towards like uh, just uh, uh, 
uh, on mapping, uh, on just predicting specific paths, right? Uh, and uh, in particularly for the first uh, waypoints, which we always follow, the drop is only uh, five percent. Now let's do uh, blank, uh, like uh, semant black uh, visual semantics. So VLN without the V. And here it drops more. So it drops from and uh, at the beginning actually drops uh, more than uh, the five percent. So it's, uh, it's some indication that uh, uh, the vision is the the. the network pays more attention to the vision than the language. Our network, right? This is not a, the inherent uh, issue in the, in the VLM program. And uh, the second is also getting rid of the occupancy. That uh, you can really even go through walls or anything. So just uh, uh, keeping only the instruction. In the previous one, uh, we had actually, we just replaced the object with something occupied, this white thing, but no label. Now it's just a, a green thing. Everything is traversable. And here we really see that the drop is significant. So which means actually from in, vision, in our network, the way it is trained, the most important thing is actually what we were doing in the classic slum, that is really, if we has a strong, that uh, if we really eliminate the occupancy, that uh, it really cannot go, it really can very hardly navigate. And the last one, which is my weakness, because I have done a lot of research in covariance, is uh, flipping, uh, uh, so there are, in about uh, uh, three quarters of the instructions, you have the word left or right. Uh, and many of them have both. So flipping the word left to right and right to left, and flipping all your images, like just like this, 180 degrees. And uh, we see that there is uh, the same drop as in uh, replacing the semantic images, which means that, uh, and uh, 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 this is uh, embarrassing for me, a geometer, that uh, my environment uh, confuses everything if you flip it left to right and confuses it uh, as much as uh, eliminating the labels of the semantics. So building uh, equivariance, meaning that uh, we don't have this effect and we don't have this effect even for like other orientations, uh, is uh, a very good problem. I'm not going to show uh, I'm not going to explain how we do it, but we have a new paper on how to build equivariant transformers, uh, which is uh, by just uh, learning individual uh, like objects, how can you really reconstruct the scene with any orientation between the objects. I think I have to stop, right? <laughs> it is 64 minutes. 64 minutes. Sometime I have to stop. All right. Um, sorry to my students that I'm not going to present the covariant stuff. But uh, this is uh, uh, a reconstruction in Matterport. Uh, just reconstruction with a neural field. So David is here, the expert on that. A coordinate-based network. Uh, I would love to talk more uh, separately about this where uh, uh, the system has been trained only on individual objects or shape net and uh, still can reconstruct uh, complicated scenes uh, just by querying the XYZ positions. Uh, so where the objects are in any orientation. So um, first, uh, I mean, uh, it's really you have seen uh, there is uh, generative models for video, there is uh, diffusion in 3D, there is DALI, stable diffusion, and uh, I mean, these are amazing, right? And uh, uh, results that you see in the press, 
and on the other hand, uh, you try to go from A to B and follow a language instruction, and you are still in between 30 and 40 percent success rate, right? So there is a definitely there will be work where people will try to exploit uh, large models, whether generative or uh, large language models, where uh, like GPT-3 in uh, this task, and uh, well, this is definitely a way to go. So uh, the message here is that uh, uh, we believe in maps. That's the main message. That uh, pretty much uh, maps uh, is all you need for both semantic navigation and visual language navigation, uh, as opposed to seeing something, take an action, seeing something, take an action, seeing something. So we have a way to efficiently hallucinate the whole map. We studied ELN with ground truth maps, and we say if we hallucinate the map well, then we can probably solve it as good as with ground truth maps. And uh, I think uh, there is a lot of work needed in uh, studying what really matters. And we have seen that uh, our system is quite, actually, quite uh, many cognitive biases with respect to uh, language uh, and semantics and also uh, geometry. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming here today and thank you everybody in Zoom. Can you talk more about your Matterport thing? About which Can one? Can you put maybe the last slide on the one the, the, the thing? Yes. Did you say the more about that? Yes, definitely. So, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this, uh, so what is the way? Uh, so you need uh, to build uh, uh, a an occupancy map, even a very sparse point cloud, you need to give uh, to get an occupancy map which is uh, independent of the coordinate system, the orientation and the position of the object. And uh, the way we do that is uh, by building a transformer, both for the encoder here, which is really building the priors, and for the decoding here, which is uh, what uh, is called the coordinate based. And uh, uh, it has to be uh, equivalent both to uh, translations and rotations. The translation is quite easy. Uh, we consider only neighborhoods, like a graph. And for each point xi, we take only the difference to your neighbor. This makes it automatically translation invariant, actually, not even equivalent. And the really trick is about the rotation, and this is coming uh, also, it is related to the alpha fold, and it's the same problem predicted in XYZ in uh, uh, protein structure prediction. So what you really want is uh, when you're using uh, the, uh, the key matrix of the attention or uh, the value matrix, that uh, if uh, uh, so you have outputs, which are not scalars here, but they are vectors or even higher order tensors. You want, uh, if you multiply it with a representation of the rotation on the left, that the result will be the same as uh, uh, multiplying it uh, on the right for the same, actually, rotation R. And, uh, uh, there are specific methods on how to build these uh, matrices uh, using uh, uh, like more like a representation theory rotation matrices. Uh, it is uh, depending on whether it's scalar vector matrix. Uh, there is uh, uh, like a, a formal recipe on how to do that. Uh, there is an easy way to do that, which is the vector neurons from Stanford. Uh, where uh, the structure of uh, uh, it's, it's uh, you enforce everything to remain as a n by three 
metrics, and we always post multiply with a standard rotation, 3 by 3 from robotics. And this is the way you achieve equivariance up to this point. Uh, then uh, the trick is to achieve equivariance here, which uh, is not uh, in the vector neurons, the input is only invariant. And uh, the same actually, you can uh, build a uh, so here the input, what uh, our novelty is that uh, our input here is not the coordinate itself, it's uh, the, uh, the neighborhood, uh, it's uh, the, the vector, the encoded vector for a particular point, which you take by interpolating the neighborhood. So this is, uh, uh, if you had a continuous signal, like discrete signal, like a sphere or something, or a plane, the convolution is really all you need for equivariance. For point sets or sparse sets like this, or graphs, uh, they, you really need uh, uh, like a trans something like a transformer. Any other questions? Objects are stationary. Uh, target objects are stationary. Yes. Is there an application for moving targets with the work that you have? Uh, that uh, is a very good uh, uh, actually question. Uh, for moving target, uh, uh, you need uh, to build the uh, statistics of uh, the way we formulate the problem. Uh, we need to build statistics about the trajectory of the target. Uh, there are, and not only from the next frame, you really need a rollout. Uh, so there are a lot of like uh, stochastic prediction frameworks for that. Um, this is, uh, uh, I mean, I would, uh, there is a lot uh, of prediction in video. And I think in that case, the prediction would be on uh, XY on the map. Uh, it's a very interesting problem to work on. I have another question. So, um, it's, yeah, I have another question. So, in the second one that you tackled, all the paths that you found are plotted on the map. I was curious, how do you make sure that the paths are consistent between frame to frame? Otherwise, I'm worried about cases where you can oh, get like, fluctuating that, paths. That uh, I uh, I mentioned only briefly. We don't follow the whole path once we predict. We predict uh, ten waypoints. And uh, uh, then uh, we go to the closest waypoint to us now. The closest waypoint to us now may be the fourth waypoint. And uh, then uh, we go to that point using some reinforcement learning. And then we predict the whole path again. So we don't have any, uh, neither a monitoring along one path, nor a monitoring uh, uh, with respect to the video. There is other works, who, other people who work just on that problem, on monitoring your progress towards your goal. Uh, we, our only monitor is really with respect to the, the goal prediction. Okay. I have one other question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, you VLN. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, I think uh, we have to work more. I mean, probably uh, Daphne here has uh, more ideas. <laughs> but uh, first, we need to study uh, better which uh, uh, like parts of the language really matter. Uh, we only we we are studying about. Uh, there are also another paper. Uh, we have studied like stop words and uh, we even like studied punctuation if we eliminate it. And uh, I think uh, there is work uh, where you can put additional tokens about the meaning, like of left and right or uh, like uh, motion verbs. Uh, we have introduced the notion of navigation concepts, uh, like four classes like of things like 
situation like you are between two things, uh, moving, and uh, you can actually bring this uh, notion directly into the input uh, of uh, your language, like as an additional token. Uh, now, there's definitely, I think, uh, interesting work to do, like, prof you can probably write a prompt uh, in GPT-3 with uh, the instruction and have the path as the output and really see what we'll do and this is something that uh, I was really thinking that uh, a lot of the instruction is really a visual odometry like uh, just a, a path integration so that probably you could probably get a very good paths uh, without even seeing the environment in many cases or on the other hand eliminate all possible verbs keep only the objects in the instruction and uh, uh, just uh, try to align it with objects so there is a lot of probing work we have to do to really see what uh, matters but also like using a big model I think this is so obvious that we have to do that. Sorry. Thank you. One more. Nothing. Oh, no, <laughs> 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 Ask me. Yeah, uh, it is uh, 20, yeah, I can tell you, in the RxR, in the RxR dataset, out of 80,000 instructions, 23,000 have left and 20,000 have right, and about, uh, I think, uh, 15,000 have both. So Even though they're relatively balanced, we still got that much of a performance uh, yeah, because uh, we don't take, a, take care at all uh, on uh, having such a representation in the attention. In the attention, we take the grades, so we have a pretty much good uh, serial sequence of the tokens on the language, but then uh, on the map, uh, uh, and we really have to work more on the positional encoding on, that, on, the, on the map, uh, but uh, on the map, we really take the grid and we make it a vector, so there is no, not very, very good. Uh, this is sort of a, a fundamental problem with birds because it's, left and right are always using the same context and same systems. You're not going to get different representations. I see. Good to know. Yeah, just a follow up on that. Uh, have you tried like just making the uh, instructions on the map? Doing training as a data augmentation techniques, does that, will that help this? Like? Oh, yeah, definitely. This will help. Yeah, no, we didn't. I mean, uh, because uh, our equivariance approach is uh, without augmentation, it's really yeah. built in the, in the network. Yeah. Um, I think if we flip everything, yes. then it will perform. Right. Yes, sir. So, you were talking about adding additional forecast to the language model. Uh, what about like uh, fine tuning uh, the, the, the language model so that uh, to like ground it more in these navigation tasks and try to solve like, so, like translating first, right? Translating first on something that is uh, yeah, more structured. Some, some language tasks maybe translation or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a very good idea. Uh, and, uh, for me, it's also like uh, when it says uh, move or turn, uh, why not uh, just replace it with an actual uh, like action, right? Instead of having a bird vector. Yeah. Uh, we have, yeah, we haven't tried it. It's a very good uh, idea. I don't know. Uh, Daphne can tell us uh, more about that. <laughs> to, re to, re to replace it with a more structured uh, sentence. Yeah, I, I think that's a real difficulty. Because it's designed like the two words are very close synonyms of each other, and they're going to be really close in the larger betting space. And as far as the training data looks, left and right are synonyms of each other because they're used in very similar contexts most of the time. So some sort of structured space might make more sense. So for the object object model map machine, what do you think is the best um, way to encode these kind of semantic relationships? I guess, use an example like the washroom is usually near yellow. Yeah, 
Yes, that's a very good. That's a very good question. And uh, uh, in uh, in general, like knowledge acquisition, that was usually done with a graph, right? And the statistics of a graph. Here, it's very implicit. Just uh, this is this is the context. That uh, the same way in an image, when you do a semantic segmentation with uh, pretty much a unit or hour plus uh, uh, structure, all the global context. That, uh, for example, the refrigerator is close to the oven, is encoded uh, implicitly in this uh, bottom that you have here like a 16 by 16 or even just a vector which is the global encoding of the image. Uh, ideally, uh, it would be better to have some graph where uh, these are already like these neighborhoods are explicitly stated. And we would still need a prior that would be a global, uh, for a global sim prior but uh, not uh, uh, getting it out of the grid, but getting it out of the graph. Uh, I mean, the graph is more uh, plausible because uh, you can even from the edges of the graph, you can get statistics of uh, who is next to who, right? which objects are next to the other one. But here is only the, this bottom. Oh, Florian. I don't want to misquote, but I, I think you have said that the most difficult problem in robot vision is data association. Is that, is that correct? That's before. Uh, I have said it in another talk, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and so you, uh, have, you have an audience of PhD students and uh, this would be, you know, graph students. All right. So uh, what you, do you think are the most important problems? So in the, indeed, uh, uh, and I had uh, at least uh, two students working on data association before. And data association, pretty much before deep learning was always like a temporal data association in Slam, right? The correspondence problem or correspondence between views. Having uh, semantic priors, the association is really association between your priors and the object. Is, uh, and uh, here, uh, all the association, as you have seen, is really done inside the attention map. So this association between the word and and uh, your map is just uh, in some like a row of the uh, some uh, row of the semant of the attention map. And uh, there are also other like in tracking, in classical problems in tracking. Uh, originally, at the beginning, tracking was replaced by tracking by redetection, right? Uh, Deep learning was good. I'm going to just detect always the same object again and again. But now that we have uh, transformers and we can deal better with sequences and uh, longer term uh, associations, uh, I think uh, we can really solve uh, very well the data association problem. And uh, we had a very, we had very heavy toolbox of probabilistic techniques for that. But uh, I think uh, the transformers have a pretty clean way to show you, like not only the prediction from time t to t plus one, but really like you're from across the whole sequence. And that's why also you have seen now, again, tracking papers. Uh, tracking paper, tracking was out, right, for quite a while. Now with transformers, there are a lot of uh, like uh, tracking papers again at the vision conferences. So the answer is uh, the transformer, the attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, originally, like in language translation, language translation was also an associate data association in our terms, a correspondence problem. All right, so let's uh, 